I don't understand. It doesn't matter. Are you sure? Yep. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. As long as the right thing's being recorded. Hi, everyone. Hi. Hi. <laughs> My name's Quaid. Um, Quaid Morris. I'm a, a computational biologist. Uh, I'm an associate professor at the University of Toronto. Uh, I've been doing this for about 10 years. Uh, in terms of my lab. I'm interested in primarily in post-transcriptional regulation, gene regulation, RNA binding proteins. Uh, I've also become interested recently in, in analyzing cancer genomes and I work on electronic medical records. Um, and I'm a co-developer of one of the tools that we're going to be uh, uh, we're going to be introducing to you tomorrow called Gene Mania. Uh, and I've been teaching in the um, uh, Canadian Bioinformatics Workshop for about the last six or seven years. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel comfortable just to stop me and ask me. Uh, I'm going to be here for the afternoon as well, so you know, just feel like um, uh, we're here to help you. And so, if anything's unclear, I'll try to make it clear. Just in the in interest of time, if there's like detailed questions, what I might do is I might try to answer them at lunch or in the afternoon instead. But but please don't don't feel shy to ask me any questions. I like it when there's a little bit of back and forth. Right, so what am I talking to you about today? So I'm talking about uh, finding overrepresented pathways in gene lists. And this is, this is a somewhat of a theoretical talk, but it also has very practical aspects. What I'm going to teach you about is I'm going to teach you about the statistics that go into uh, computing these p-values that you're going to be reporting for when you do the uh, pathway enrichment analysis, which is like, you know, an important component of every genomics paper these days, right? Okay, so uh, I have a list of learning objectives here. So these are things that, that you should be able to do uh, at the end of today. Uh, and you can read them, I can read them aloud to you, or you can just, you can just look at them. Um, but maybe just check them off at the end of the, uh, at the end of the, uh, at the end of the talk. Okay. Oh, I think I have this thing that, that advances the slides for me. Just let me see. Whoa, great. Okay, so what am I going to talk to you uh, about? So I'm just going to do an introduction to enrichment analysis, just to make the concepts clear, because I, I realized there was some difficulty with some part of the concepts uh, during Marie's talk. Uh, and I'm going to introduce you to the hypergeometric test. It's also called Fisher's exact test. And if you're doing one type of enrichment analysis, we're just comparing your gene list to uh, a, uh, what I'm going to call a gene set, or a set of gene annotations. There's only one test that you need to know. And that's, in fact, the only test for this type of thing. And all the other tests are approximations of this test. And that test is called Fisher's exact test. Right now, now, if instead of just having a fixed gene list, you have a ranking of genes, and you want to ask whether or not uh, genes with a given annotation are near the top or near the bottom of the list, then you're in the world of uh, uh, test for rank lists. And I'm going to uh, describe one test called the minimum hypergeometric test. There's about four or five other tests for this. They're all basically similar. There's one that's slightly different. Um, but, you know, there, you have to make some choices, and I'll, I'll help you try to guide your choices. Um, now, when you test for uh, enrichment of more than one category, or more than one gene set, you have to correct for multiple tests. Uh, otherwise, the p-values you report are going to be wrong. And then there's two multiple test corrections. There's one called the von Peroni correction, which is really easy. And then there's the false discovery rate correction, which people like a little bit better. Slightly more complicated, but not that complicated. All right, so as I said, there's two types of enrichment analysis. So you have a gene list, so you've made some choices about what genes you think are the ones that you're going to look for enrichment in. Like these are the ones that are responsive to whatever drug you've treated your cells with. These are the ones that have shown up as being overexpressed in your microarray analysis, your RNA-seq analysis now. These are the proteins that you've detected in a proteomic analysis and the cell type of interest after the perturbation. And so the here, this, this answers the question, are my gene sets surprisingly enriched, are any gene sets surprisingly enriched or depleted in my gene list? Okay, so there's two different sets of genes here, and I might screw it up when I, when I describe it. I'll try to be as careful as I can. So the gene list is what your experiment provides, right? The gene set is something, is a set of annotations that someone has come up with. I'll try to call the gene sets annotations so I don't mix them up. But realize there's two sets here, and you're going to be looking at the overlap between those two sets and ask whether or not that overlap is surprisingly big or not. Okay? Okay, and as I said, there's one test, Fisher's exact test. That's all you need to know. 
Uh, if, so an, if you have some way of ranking your genes, say you have like some sort of differential expression analysis, for example, these rank lists, uh, these enrichment analysis on rank lists, they answer the question, are any gene sets ranked surprisingly high or surprisingly low on my rank list of genes? Are they near the top or are they near the bottom? Okay, and then the Cisco test I'm going to describe is the minimum hypergeometric test, and there's a ton of others that we won't discuss, but I'll make connections between the hypergeometric, minimum hypergeometric test and the other statistical tests that are very similar to it when I introduce it. Okay, so just to, uh, I went fairly quickly through the concept, so let's, let's, let's go more slowly through the concept. And we're going to use microarrays here because you know, everybody kind of remembers what microarrays are and they're, they're nice to think about. You can replace that with RNA-seq now if you want. Okay, so we have some gene expression table. We have some way of deciding which genes are responsive to the condition of the perturbation that we're interested in studying. And we take that, that information and we add these gene set databases. This is, for example, gene ontology, KEG, some of the other pathway databases that, that Yuri mentioned in his talk. And we compare those two things and then we have some enrichment table where we have a gene set and a p-value associated with the enrichment of that gene set based on things that are, uh, the, the set of genes that are um, perturbed in this experiment. Okay, so just to make things a little bit more um, um, clear, here's a gene list. These are uh, genes that we think are responsive or that I'm interested in studying. My gene sets or annotations come from gene ontology. Maybe they're uh, a set of uh, transcription factors that have binding sites in the promoters of genes. And the question again is, are any gene annotations surprisingly interested in the gene list? That gene list is ranked. That's not ranked. This is just, uh, this is just five genes. Yeah. Uh, if, if it were ranked, it would be a lot longer. Yeah. Okay. Um, where the gene lists come from, how to assess surprisingly mass statistics, and how to correct for repeating this test. Right, because we're not going to be testing one gene set, we're going to be testing lots of gene sets. Okay, here's our expression matrix. We have like, uh, you know, case and control, for example, or uh, wild type and perturbed or something. And uh, previously, you've learned how, how to calculate these differential expression statistics. So you have genes that are upregulated potentially and genes that are downregulated, and there's various ways to compute these statistics, which uh, we I hopefully you guys are all familiar with by now. And then you can threshold by saying, okay, I'm going to draw some line, let's say twofold upregulated, and I can call these genes the upregulated ones, and let's say uh, twofold downregulated, and call these genes the downregulated ones. Now that defines a set. These genes are a set. These genes here, sorry, a list, a list. Yeah, question. So they are, here they're ranked. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna convert that rank into a gene list by threshold. So, so the, right now, this is the two class design, this is the, this is the gene list setup. Without rank. Without rank, right. Okay, now that could, you know, you could do it based on thresholding this rank list the other thing you can do is say you have some sort of time course and you see some like change in gene expression across the different conditions and then using some sort of clustering technique you define three different sets of genes that are all responsive in the same way to, to this time course. Now these different sets from the clusters, they themselves also become gene lists. There's no intrinsic rank here either. Okay, so now we're still in the gene list zone. So let's take our gene list, say these ones are upregulated, and we also need to know what the background is, and we're gonna get back to this issue here. So when I say that, uh, when, I, when I define a gene list, I'm defining that gene list compared to a background. So for example, in the old days, there, when you did a microarray experiment, sometimes the microarrays didn't cover all the genes in the genome, right? So there were microarrays, for example, called the immune array. And what the immune array contained was genes that were being expressed in the immune system. Now, if I take a subset of those genes and I ask, are those, those genes enriched for those with immune function? Guess what? Any subset will be, right? Or most subsets will be. So it shouldn't be particularly surprising that when you look at an array of measurements of genes that are being expressed in the immune system and you take a subset of those genes, that that subset, under many conditions, is going to be enriched for genes that have immune function. 
right? So you need to know what your background is. So what you're doing is you're doing a comparison against your gene list, against all the gene lists that could have come up in your experiment. And we'll get back to this concept in a while because this is an important concept. And, and I can see it's a little bit confusing, but I just want to introduce it now so that you're thinking about it when we get back to it later in the talk, okay? Okay, so here's the gene set. The gene set will overlap with the gene list. It will also overlap a little bit with the background, and there's gonna be some genes that are neither in the gene list nor the background that are in the gene set. All right, let's go back to this example of the immune array. You know, not all the genes are on the immune array. Okay, okay. so, yeah, question. A gene set is a set of genes. <laughs> Okay, so, so gene set is something that you get from a pre-existing database, like an annotation. So it's like a pathway, or it's a, like a go annotation. That's the gene set. These are the things that are defining function that you're trying to find enrichment for. And usually your gene set would be huge, right? No, not huge necessarily. I mean, bigger than your gene list. No, not always, no. Um, So, the, so the, the gene ontology has a lot of categories in it, right? For example, development or like heart development, those are all categories of gene function. Each one of those categories is associated with a gene set. So like development, genes are involved in development, that's probably a huge list. I would say that's probably in the thousands. Genes are involved in heart development, that's a smaller list. I'd say that's probably less than 100, right? Gene involvement, eye development is probably even smaller. Right, so, so and one thing is, is so these, these categories, they vary a lot in size. And it tends to be the most informative categories are the ones that are sort of in the dozens, like 10 to 100, right? Because if you find out that your gene list is, in, uh, is enriched and genes are involved in development, great. But it doesn't tell you very much specifically. And so, so actually later on in the talk, I'll talk a little bit about how to choose go categories because uh, it's important to do so because the more categories that you test, the more stringent your multiple test correction needs to be. Yeah. Yeah, so this is, so the, this is the database, so these, there's a whole bunch of gene sets here, and this is one specific gene set. And this gene set has some overlap with the gene list, it has some overlap with the background, and it also has possibly some genes that were neither in the gene list nor the background. Because these two, the gene list and the background doesn't necessarily cover the entire genome. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'll keep that in mind for later. Okay, so we call this the query set. Do you want me to call it the query set? Yeah, so this is the now, what we have. Yeah, so this is, oh, so the gene list should be the query set. About yours, theirs, and yours, and yours. Let's just go through as a slide, otherwise. Okay, it's okay. set. Yeah, if I'm gonna have to change, uh, if I'm gonna have to change my language halfway through the talk, things are gonna go off the rails really quickly. Okay, so so just map it onto what, the way you're thinking about it. Gene set is what you're testing enrichment for. Gene list is what you're te testing enrichment in, and the background is the background you're testing enrichment against. Maybe. Okay. Okay. Great. So the output enrichment test is the p-value. And the p-value assesses the probability that this overlap that you see here is at least as large as you would get by random sampling from this, this background and the gene list. Okay? That's what the p-value assesses. Assess. It's, it's a measure of like how likely this overlap is to be if I was sampling randomly gene lists of the same size from the background. Ah, okay. Okay. 
Okay, so step one, you define your gene list and your background list. Step two, you define your gene sets to test for enrichment, like your annotation databases. Step three is you run enrichment and test and correct for multiple testing if necessary, and almost it's necessary if you have if you conduct more than one test. Step four, you interpret your enrichment. Step five, you publish. <laughs> now we're done, right? Okay. So so there's there, uh, there's discussion about rank lists, and there, uh, so let's let's say why you might want to test enrichment rank lists. So you know you can always take a rank list and you can threshold it somewhere to define a gene list, an unranked gene list, right? So why would you want to consider the entire rank? Well, maybe there's no natural value for this threshold in your rank list. Sometimes there is a natural value, right? If you're calculating the p-value for a differential expression, maybe you want to you, you choose the threshold of p equals uh, 0.05, for example, plus some other uh, some other threshold on effect size. People often use two-fold upregulated or 1.5-fold upregulated. But even the, regardless of that, you, know, you, still, you still might be losing statistical power by choosing this threshold. And it can be somewhat of an arbitrary choice. So, and you might get different results, different threshold settings. And as I said, you get this loss of statistical power. Say you choose your threshold wrong, and then you've got a whole bunch of other uh, genes of that annotation that are just below your threshold. Well, you can, with the sort of rank list type analysis, identify these, these, these enrichments even if like the differential expression doesn't achieve your like P of 0.05 threshold. So please add a first world problem with gene list without them. Correct. Okay. Yeah. This is why you might want to consider using a rank list. It's certainly easier to test a gene list. There's one test, there's tons of tools that'll do it for you. Um, that might be your first approach. Right, but rank gene, uh, people have moved to testing rank lists of gene. And certainly if you don't have some, any natural way of ranking, like you in this methylation example that you introduced, you know, you do have to use a gene list. Okay. All right, and so the rank list in, uh, enrichment is basically the same as the gene set enrichment, and, but you know, now instead of defining a threshold, you just take the ranking. And you have to find some way of ranking the gene list, right? You can rank it by p-value, maybe you rank it by effect size, maybe you rank it by, rank it by some combination between the p-value and effect size. I can't tell you what the answer to that question is. I will give you some advice later on, but you know, there's various different ways to rank the list. Okay, and then here you have to choose some tests that, that looks for enrichment and rank lists. And I'm gonna talk about the minimum hypergeometric test, because that's a test that Gene Profiler uses, and that's the tool that we're gonna be learning uh, to use. Okay? And then you get the same thing, you get some enrichment thing and the output of this test is a p-value. Okay, so the recipe for the ranked gene list is the same as the recipe for the uh, for just the normal gene list, except step one is rank your gene. Step five is still publishing. Wait. Yeah, tell me, sorry. Uh, I'm sorry, can you please uh, speak louder? I couldn't hear you. Sorry? Ranking by clusters. If you want to have a rank list based on a cluster, So, so the question is how you would rank genes by cluster. So now, now there's a couple that, so the, I, I think what you said is, is that you, you enumerate the clusters and then you assign the gene a score that base, is based on the clusters that it comes from. Um, you could do that. Uh, the thing is, is you have to have some natural ordering of the clusters, right? So, you know, is cluster six somehow bigger than cluster five? And is cluster five somehow bigger than cluster four? Right? If you don't have a natural ordering of the clusters, then it's just like, like you know, having genes that are colored, like, okay, here's the red green gene, here's the green gene, here's the blue gene, here's the purple gene. What comes first? You don't know. But if you do have a natural ordering, you can certainly do it by cluster number. The other thing that you can do is a lot of the clustering algorithms themselves, they have like, um, like a centroid or an exemplar. They have like a pattern which is shared by everything in the cluster. So you can rank based on like, choosing a specific cluster, looking at this pattern, this sort of like temporal expression pattern, and asking how close each gene's expression pattern is to that temporal expression pattern. And that might be another way. That's like ranking the degree to which gene is like, this gene is likely to be in cluster one. That's another approach. Does that make sense? Okay. 
Okay. Both buttons seem to advance the slides. Okay, so now we're going to do a, a little bit of theory. So I'm going to talk to you about this Fisher's exact test. Sometimes people call it Fisher's exact test, and sometimes people call it the hypergeometric test. I'm going to use both so that you're familiar with both. You're used to hearing them both. Also, sometimes I, I change what I call it. Um, and then I'm going to tell you what the minimum hypergeometric test is for the rank lists. Then I'm going to tell you what these two multiple corrections are. Okay. All right, hypergeometric test. Okay, here's the null hypothesis. Every time you have a p-value, you have to have some null hypothesis. The p-value is the probability that the null hypothesis is what generated the data. Okay, so here the, is, is that the gene list that you have, these are the five genes that I introduced before, and these are unranked, is a random sample from the population. So what does that mean? It means that I, I put the, the, in this case, the black genes are the ones in the gene list, and the red genes are the ones that are in the background. And I reached in and I pulled out five random balls from this background population. Okay? And then what's the probability that I get four or more black balls? Right? That's what the hypergeometric p-value calculates. Right? And so if the probability that the null hypothesis is true, the probability that by just by random chance I pulled out four or more black balls, if that's less than 0.05, then I say that this gene list is significantly enriched for black balls. Okay. So what is that probability? Well, you can compute it using something called the hypergeometric function, and you can look that up in Wikipedia, and you'll see lots of math. Um, and basically, you can plot the probability that you would pull zero black balls out of five if you reached into this background population. One black ball out of five, two black balls, three, four. And these are what those probabilities are. And the p-value is simply the probability to get four or more black balls. So you sum up four plus five. And that's what, this, that's what that number is. So you can compute this yourself. I'm not giving you the equation, but you can get the equation on, on, on Wikipedia. Most people just like to plug these numbers into uh, like, uh, like some online computer or, or use an online tool. Okay. And that's an all distribution. And so, so the, re, the, the thing that you need to compute this p-value is something called the two by two contingency table. So in this case, I'm, as the rows, I'm saying the, the ones that are in the gene set and the ones that are not in the gene set, the ones that are in the gene list and the not in the gene list, right? So there's four black balls. So the, there's four genes that are both in the gene list and black. There is one gene that's in the gene list and red. And then in, you know, once you remove these five genes, there's 496 black balls left in the bin, and there's 4,499 4, 4, red balls left in the bin. That's how you fill out the two by two contingency table. The good news is, is generally you don't need to do this, right? But you can find online tools that will compute this p-value for you. Okay, so sometimes people aren't interested in testing for over-enrichment, they want to find depletion. So if you want to find depletion, you can, you can just test for over-enrichment of the background. Very rarely you're going to be looking for depletion or you'll be getting a significant p-value depletion. You need kind of a very large gene list in order to get that. Okay, so now let's go back to this discussion. You need to choose the background population appropriately. And so the example I used was kind of an old example where you have a microarray that only, uh, uh, only looks at immune system genes. But now we're, we're you know, in the present day, we have RNA-seq, we have raw proteomics. So there's different ways you need to think about defining your background population. Okay. For example, you're looking in um, you know, some sort of cell population, and you're looking for differential expression of some gene under some condition. Right. Now, certainly, if that gene is not expressed in your population, either you know, just in, under normal conditions or under the differential expression conditions, maybe that shouldn't show up. Maybe that gene shouldn't be in your background population. It's not something that you're going to be able to detect differential expression of. Right. So what you need to think about when you're defining your gene list is you need, uh, when you're defining your background population, 
is you need to think about all the genes that could have appeared on your gene list if your experiment had gone differently. Right? And so that's what the, that is the, like, for me, that's the intellectual equivalent of assuming that you have, like, this immune system array that only measures expression of a subset of the genes in the gene. Okay. Now, one, if you want to think about that for a little while and then get back to me with questions about how to define background populations, I'm happy to answer them at lunch or in this afternoon, and I'm also here tomorrow. Okay, because this, this, this is the part of the talk where people usually have the most questions, so in fact, you guys don't have any questions. Okay, good, I have one question. Yeah, you would take all the genes that are on your array. Okay, so, so there's, there's, okay, so let me distinguish between two different things here. Okay, in your paper, if you want to report that a gene has upregulated expression, you should be using the p-value that you get for measuring upregulated expression, right? So now, but what we're doing here is we're defining a gene list of interest. Right? So when you're defining this gene list of interest, you can think of that p-value as a way of ranking your genes, as a way of having confidence that they're upregulated. Now you, you can define your gene list any way that you want. So you can, you can use p-values that are larger than 0.05 to define your gene list, for example. Now you don't want to go too big, because then you're going to start putting in genes that are probably not upregulated. But in terms of saying in your paper, that this, these genes are upregulated, and making that statistical claim, you have to use the p-value yeah. that you got out of that. So, so can you say, just one yeah. So I, uh, I have to think about your question in a little bit more detail. Can we, can we talk about it uh, at lunch? And then and if other people are interested in the answer, I, I can get up in front of people and, and everybody and give you the answer then. Right. I agree with that. Okay, so did, did everyone follow that discussion? I wasn't sure if it was loud enough for everybody to hear. So the question is defining the background, and I, I think the answer that <coughs> we came up with was that you define the background based on the genes that are actually expressed under the conditions that you're looking at. Question. Two questions. An experiment in cell type specific system. Uh, 
Right. Okay. Right. So, so the, I think it's more of a comment. Where what you're saying is, if you're doing a, an experiment specific cell type, you might not actually know the set of genes that are being expressed in that cell type. So you would use the bat, the entire genome as a background by default. So, I mean, the problem is, okay, so there's, there's two ways of looking at this, the answer to that question. Okay, one way of looking to, at the answer to that question is if, if that gene's not being expressed in the cell type, it's not gonna be affected by your perturbation. The other way of looking at that is your perturbation might induce atopic expression or might induce expression of genes that normally wouldn't be expressed in that cell type. So it becomes difficult to answer the question of how to define the background. You have to make that decision yourself, right? And then and the way you make that decision is, as, as you said, and as I said previously, is that this is, you know, your background is all the genes that could have shown up as being, up, you know, differentially expressed under the condition that you're measuring. And then that could, do, that could be due to your ability to measure them, Right, so you know some genes you can't map RNA seq. You know some genes it's very hard to map RNA seq reads to because they contain a lot of repeats. Right, or some proteins are really hard to to get uh, tandem mass spec data out of because they don't give good peptides. So that's one thing to keep in mind, and then the other thing to keep in mind is whether or not that gene would ever be po if it's ever possible for it to be expressed in that cell type that you're looking. At. I mean, it's not terrible to use the entire genome as your background. You should just be careful when you look at it if you, if you don't fool yourself because of this like immune array thing, right? If you're only ever gonna be able to see genes that are expressed in the immune system in, in your gene list, you shouldn't be surprised if the, any random subset of your gene list is enriched for immune function. So you're switching from microarray to like RNA seq, for example. Yeah. So, so you're switching. You're using uh, NGS, like uh, or RNA seq, and the representation is random. What do you mean? Okay, so, so the question is, 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 again, in defining genomic background, and the specific question is related to, like, for example, if you're using a new experimental protocol where, like in NGS uh, sequencing, for example, where not all genes necessarily would be able to be measured because potentially they're not amenable to, to, uh, to the protocol that you're using in terms of getting into uh, being able to be, you know, show up in the flow cell. We, we could discuss this, so, so, I mean, one thing you could do is you could look at genes that are expressed in under any condition. I mean, those are certainly things that, that you can measure, and that could be your background. And that's, that's typically what, what I do in my lab, is, is I say, okay, well, let's see genes that are expressed under any of the conditions, those are my backgrounds, and then my gene list is the ones that are expressed under the specific condition. And that might, that's one way of defining it. I mean, these are, but they're hard philosophical questions to answer. 
So like, for example, one of my colleagues, Anne-Claude Gingras, she is, a pro she is proteomics, and she keeps a database around of proteins that she's actually been able to detect under some perturbations in a cell type, uh, cell type of interest. And that would be, that would solve the question that you're answering, how to define this, this background set under the assumption that not all genes can be measured. But we, I, and I see, I see Michelle's being a little bit uncomfortable, so I'm going to go on at this point, but I'm happy to discuss this more later on. Okay, all right. You got to think about it. Yeah. Okay. All right. So here we go. What? Yeah. Yeah. They might challenge your. Yeah. Uh, and you, as a reviewer, can challenge someone else's background choice. All right. Okay. Uh, I've reviewed too much. Um, okay, so if you just have a gene list, uh, Fisher's exact test is the test that you use. Uh, sometimes people tell you use binomial test or chi-squared test. Those are approximations of Fisher's exact test back when computers weren't fast. Because uh, with Fisher's exact test, you've got to sum up a whole bunch of different terms, right? So, and some people haven't realized that computers are now fast enough to compute the exact test. That's why it's called the exact test. The chi-squared is an approximation to the exact test. Rank lists, so like I said, minimum hypergeometric test is what we're going to learn. This is extremely similar to another test called the GSCA test, which you probably all heard about. And the GSCA test is extremely similar to another test called Komodoro Spirnov test. Right? So these are these three tests, uh, the description I'm going to give you more or less applies for all of these three tests. There's another test, well, there's another two tests that also it's the same test, it's got two different names. It's called either the Wilcoxon Rank Sum Test or the Man Whitney U Test, and they're identical. Uh, sometimes people call them the Wilcoxon Man Whitney Test. Nobody realized it until recently that they're identical. And this is like a robust T test. So it asks whether or not the median of genes in the gene set is different from genes in your, uh, uh, not in the gene set, in your gene list. Okay. Sorry? I, I can't see who's speaking. Sorry. Oh, there you are. Sorry. <laughs> Which do I recommend? Well, um, ask me that question again when I introduce it. So they, they can test for different things. So the nice thing about the Wilcoxon is uh, it's easy to get the p-value up. The problem with the Wilcoxon is that there's some types of differences between gene lists uh, that it, it doesn't detect. Whereas these other tests will detect some types of differences. Um, I used to have a slide about this. We'll see if that slide is still on my deck. And if it's not, I'll, I'll explain that uh, when we get to that point. OK. So how do you compute the minimum hypergeometric test? Uh, so you calculate the p-value of multiple thresholds. So you know how to compute the hypergeometric p-value now, right? So you now you just you have this ranked list. And everything on the, on the list is either in the gene set or it's not in the gene set. And then you just go down, and you know one thing you could do is you could try every possible threshold, compute the p-value at every one of those thresholds, and then you take the minimum p-value. Okay. That's not an incorrect way of describing what this test actually does. And here's a paper that uh, introduces the test. Okay, um, but the problem is, as you know, is you're taking the, this, you're ta computing this p-value at multiple thresholds. So you, you do need to correct for multiple testing, and, and I'm going to tell you how, you how you would do this. Okay, so like I said, so here we go. So here's your gene set, and I'm representing genes in the gene set as, as lines, and then I'm representing the, the list of genes that you have, so these are all the genes in your background, um, as, as this kind of continuous gradient, right? And so. The, the location here shows the line. The line shows you where it ranks in this continuous gradient. So maybe this is like rank five here, and this is like rank 
Uh, well, let's talk about percentiles. So this is probably in like the 60th percentile, and this is like in the, the third percentile or something. Okay. So now, now the question is, are, are these lines, are they significantly towards one end or the other end of the list? Okay. okay. So, so to do that, you need some way of computing the score, this, uh, some enrichment score. Right? And like I said before, what you're doing basically with the hypergeometric, the minimal hypergeometric test, is you're looking at each one of these lines where the where a, a, a gene from the gene set shows up in the rank, and you're you're saying, well, what would be the p-value here if we thresholded just before just below that gene? Right? So what I'm gonna be plotting in the next slide is I'm gonna be plotting those p-values as a function of where you are in that rank list. Right now, p-values are not really fun to look at and plot, so what I'm going to plot instead is the negative log 10 of the p-value. So what does that mean? So if it's like the p-value is 10 to the minus 3, the e that I'm going to plot is 3. Right? The p-value is 10 to the minus 5, the e I'm going to plot is 5. Right? It's just an easy way of looking at really small numbers. Okay. So here's the negative log of the base 10 p-value, right? So if we go up here, the highest point is the threshold at which we get the smallest p-value. Okay, so now what's happened here is I've just calculated the p-value at every single gene in this list. And wherever you get a gene from the gene set, the p-value, the negative log of p-value, so the p-value goes down, so this number goes up. So you can see whenever you get whenever you hit a new gene, the number goes up. When you go to get a gene from the that's not in the gene set, the number goes down. So, so forth like that, right? And so the maximum here is the minimum hypergeometric p-value. So that's here where you choose a threshold, and that's your final score, right? And then this is like this is the the essentially the gene list that you've identified by finding the maximum of the final score. Yeah, so, so these lines here are the annotations. Yeah, so the continuous gradient is like, is like your, all the genes in your experimental assay rank from top to bottom. And where the lines show up, these are the appearance of genes that are, that, that are in the gene set, the annotations. So this, this whole, this gene list, the rank gene list includes the background. So like you, yeah, uh, uh, so only genes, like genes, like what I've talked about before in your background, that's a set of genes that you pull from. Those are the ones that you're going to give ranks to. Yeah, any other questions? So this is a way of defining the threshold for like the third percentile or the third Precisely. Well, I mean, so I, 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 I so the, the question is, that's a way to find threshold to be upregulated. But as, as I said earlier, the question of upregulated or not is something that you do with an earlier analysis. Yeah, yeah. Right? And upregulated. Yeah, it's a way of defining the gene list of things that you that could be upregulated, but you can't say these things are upregulated because you have another p-value that tells you that. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I, I just missed the last 10 words that you okay. said. I've got a gene list that's ranked by? Uh, composite of p-value and effect size. Sure. So that's how it's like, and I've got my control, my background, in there as well. So they're going to have much lower. And I'm going to see them tail off the length of your score, the way you're doing this. And I see some of those lines there. If I can find it almost from the list to the one that caused the hit to communicate, and thereby increase the effect size, Okay, so, so the question is, can you, can you use this thing to prune your background down to a smaller well, set? Prune my, my true rank effect to a clear background that I can predict further rank. So, so you can think about like choosing this threshold as, as, as a way of doing that, right? 
So you know, choosing this threshold is, is where you get the highest enrichment p-value for this gene set. So once you choose that threshold here and you have that, this set of genes, this is the set of genes that are most enriched via some measure for the annotation that you're asking about. So if you want to do pruning, you prune from beyond here, right? But Yeah, the problem is, is, is you can't make decisions about how to do your enrichment based on the results of your enrichment. Because then you get kind of circularity. Yeah, and so, so you can't really, like you can't say, oh, now, now I'm going to take this gene out and I'm going to redo my enrichment. Because you haven't essentially done, re, already done your enrichment. And the only reason that you know that this is a bad gene is because you did your enrichment test. I mean, you could do, I mean, you could use that as a way of, say, identifying genes that might be artifacts or might have shown up as, uh, as being upregulated for some reason that's independent of things. But now you can't go back, you can't like report some p-value that you got by doing an enrichment test and then massaging your gene list or you, uh, so that you can re and re redo the enrichment test. That's circular. Or operator bias, as you mentioned. So, so the question is, when you choose the maximum p-value, you're, you're not necessarily getting everything. Yeah. I, I mean, there's nothing you can do about that. You're, you're, and you can go back and what, sorry? That's a good point. So, so the, 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 the point is, is that when you're choosing this threshold, you might not get all the genes in the pathway. And certainly we're not getting all, and we're not getting these genes in the pathway, for example. Um, and then, but later on you go back and use maybe some sort of network analysis to try to get more genes in that pathway. And that's actually something that I'm going to be talking about tomorrow. Which, so this is a really good point. The other, the other thing to say is, you know, these genes that are down here, these pathway databases aren't perfect. You know, and, and depending upon what evidence code you use for gene ontology, some of these evidence codes are just you know, like the, the function of the gene is being guessed by a computer, and no one, no human has ever looked at that. And those are called electronic annotations. So, so these these genes, maybe they're not actually involved in the pathway and they're misannotation. That's something that to also think about uh, when you go out here. I mean, you're not going to be able to do anything about that. Um, but certainly, don't get uncomfortable if you don't if you don't pick up all the genes in the pathway. Yeah. So the final score, the p value, is uh, is derived from blind gene or all the genes in the red line. So the, the the p value is basically defined by taking the threshold here and then doing a hypergeometric test up here. That's what they. That's what they. What, what I'm calling the score. Now that score isn't necessarily a p value. You have to do something to translate that score into a p value. And I'm, I'm about to describe what, what, what you can do to translate that score into a p value. Okay. Yeah. One more question. So that's a great question. The question is, what, what about gene sets that are at one end or, or, or gene sets where you have like 
like if you imagine like you know they're enriched at the top and the bottom end, right? Uh, Yuri. Yeah, so, 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 yeah, there's, so there's two answers so far to that question. One is Yuri's answer, which is just reverse the order of the gene list and do this. Um, the other, sorry, what's your name? Uh, Joseph. Joseph. And then Joseph's answer is, is just to take the absolute value. So instead of having upregulated or, or downregulated, just say differentially regulated. Okay, um, so in theory, so this is that, you know, this is. This is, I think, the point where I should maybe say something about the other tests, okay, that are like this. So there's, um, what I've drawn here, these slides, I actually use these slides in previous talks to explain the, the GSCA test, because it's so similar to the maximum hypergeometric p-value test. And the only difference is, is this axis is a little bit different. They call this the enrichment score. Instead of this being like negative log p-value, it's like some number that goes up by one when you get a gene in the gene set and goes down by something small-ish when you get a gene that's not in the gene set. Okay, and so the way that, that the GSCA works is it finds the maximum difference from zero. All right, so that could maximum absolute difference from zero. So here on the minimum hypergeometric p-value, we're finding where it's the highest and GSCA just finds it where it's most different. And so, so for example, in your question, where you have, uh, you have lines that are, if you have genes that are enriched down here, what's going to happen for the ES score is you're going to be the dip. Right? That's not going to happen when you compute the hypergeometric p-value. I mean, it can happen if you, if you set your zero at 0.5. Your p-value is going to get higher, so it might work that way. But like I don't know anybody who tries to make it work that way. So in this case, you just reverse the order of your genes. Now, now looking for this maximum difference from zero, that should also work in the case where you have like your gene lists are either at the beginning or they're at the end, right? So you're going to get what's going to happen is it's going to go up and it's going to go down and then it might and and then it might go down again here, depending upon how you compute the. And so GSCA will sometimes detect that, but the test that looks for maximum difference definitely is, is called the Komagara Smirnov test, DKS test. Okay, and it's, it's, these, it's these interesting examples where you have things at the top of the gene list and the, in the things at the end of the gene list um, that Komagara Smirnov detects and minimum hypergeometric, and I'm not sure about GSCA definitely. Right, but there's various ways around this, like reversing the order of gene list, you're taking the absolute value. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay. Great. All right, so now we got to correct this score for multiple testing. Uh, you can use a standard multiple testing correction. Uh, we see next uh, section. Uh, the other way that people have done this, and I think this is what Gene Profiler does, is you can compute empirical p values using permutations. So, what does that mean? What that means is, is that you take this, the, the rank list that you have, and then you just randomly resort it. Right? And then you see where the gene set shows up in that. You make the same plot, you find your maximum again, and then that's a number and you, you, you know, that you associate with that random permutation of the rank list. And you do that random permutations thousands of times, and you collect these numbers, and then you ask, how often is the number that you get with the real rank greater than or equal to the number that you get with this random permutation? Sorry, it's the other way around, but you'll, you'll, it'll be clear when I show you the slide. Okay, so remember what the null hypothesis is. The null hypothesis is that, that this gene set is, is distributed randomly in the rank list. And the way that we generate samples from the ra uh, uh, null hypothesis is we randomly we reorder our rank list, find out where the gene set is. When we randomly reorder the rank list, the gene set is, rep is distributed randomly in that list. Okay, so we randomly reorder the list, we get the score, 
We randomly reorder the list, we get the score. We randomly reorder the list, we get the score. And here, this is done 2,000 times. And these are the, this is the histogram of the scores that you get, and these are the counts. Right? And the score that we got is way out over here. And the p-value, using what's called this empirical way of estimating the p-value, is just the number of times you got a score at least as large as the, the score you got for the real list. It's not bootstrapping. It's called it's 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 called a, 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 a using permutations to compute empirical p values. Bootstrapping is is something that's slightly different. So bootstrapping is is resampling, recomputing something, and then what, what, what the bootstrap tells you is what your uncertainty is in that number. This is a way of, of generating samples from the null hypothesis when you can't empirically compute what the, the distribution of the null hypothesis should be. Sorry, when you can't analytically compute what the distribution should be. Yeah? I'm sorry, you gotta speak up, I can't hear you. So it doesn't depend upon your list size, um, because basically what you're asking is how often would a randomly sorted list give me a score of this high or more, right? And so, so, so what it depends on is how significant you want your p-value to be, right? So if you need a p-value that's like 10 to, the, uh, one, uh, 10 to the minus five, so it's like one in 100,000, then you need to you need to resort the list like at least a hundred thousand times. If you need a p-value that's that that's like ten to the minus three, like one in a thousand, you only need to resort it a, a thousand times, a bit more than a thousand times. Yes. Okay, so this is, I mean, this is a very, I, uh, so you're right. So, so the reason that you need very small p-values is later on you're going to correct it. And then there's a lot of discussion about, uh, that we can have about this, a beautiful statistical discussion that I love. Um, but just to answer your question quickly, what people do sometimes is, is they, they do this permutation and then they fit some sort of functional form to the distribution to estimate these tail probabilities so they can get estimates of the p-value that don't require them to do a lot of permutation. Okay, all right, so here we go. All right, and so that's, this is how these p-values are computed. I'm not recommending that you do this yourself. It's gonna take a long time, but when you see software that does an empirical p-value uh, computation, this is what's going on, right? And if you have to wait a long time for the software to run, the reason you're waiting a long time is, is it's randomly resorting these lists and then recomputing the, 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 the enrichment score. Okay. Great, so now we're on to multiple test corrections. Any quick remaining questions uh, here? So we've only got, we got half an hour, actually, I think I can do this in half an hour. So I can take a few questions. How large is that background? Usually the background is like 10 to, uh, is five to 10,000 genes. Yeah, I mean, usually that, those are the genes that your gene list is chosen from. You were earlier talking about having to say about small parameters in your medical analysis, and there's like 5,000 backgrounds compared to, say, like a small parameter in your population. Okay, so, so I, maybe I misunderstood your question. I thought you were asking about the general length of the background list. Basically, I'm saying it might be dependent on some of the characteristics, the size of the So the background list is just everything that you think your gene list should be taken from. Now, but if you're asking like how large a gene list you need to get uh, to get significant p-values, that's a little bit of a different question, and it, it's it's an, a very important question because you know because you're going to be choosing the threshold somewhat arbitrarily, 
So like often what I find is gene lists in the soil uh, in the, in the you know, between like somewhere like between 30 and 100 sometimes give you the best resolution in terms of being very specific about the functions that are being represented, but also having the uh, having you know enough statistical power that you can detect that you can detect changes. This is a really really rough guy. Right now, if your gene list has like five genes in it, it's really sometimes it's very hard to detect significant because um, the your your statistical power depends on the size of your gene list. But like that number shows up when you compute the p-value. Yeah. But that being said, people get gene lists like or like a thousand genes long, and they get really interesting things out of those gene lists. And what you're going to get is you can get a lot of categories that are significant. And then you're going to want to do some sort of further analysis, like using the enrichment map that Yuri showed, in order to kind of group those categories into function, similar functions. OK. All right. So we all want to get to step five and publish our paper, right? We can't get there until we get a significant p-value. So how do we do that? Well, there's actually a really easy way to get a significant p-value. And, and that's. That's just keeping, you know, continuing to draw balls from this distribution until we get one that we like, or until we get a draw that we like, right? So based on the p-value that, that we computed earlier for four black balls from this background population, on average, you only have to do about 8,000 draws to get something that, that, that is that significant, right? So if you want to publish a paper, you can just win this p-value lottery by just continuing to do the random draw. Now, obviously, we're not choosing a whole bunch of different gene lists, but when you when you look at different annotations, you are effectively choosing different gene lists, right? By cha changing the annotation is in some ways kind of like changing the gene list, right? So, so you have one observed draw. And now, now we've like we've marked these things as both being black and having a particular uh, shape, right? So if we like change the, if we have an observed draw like black balls, but then we say, okay, well, instead of looking at whether or not the ball is black or not, I want to see if it's round or square, or there's like 8,000 other things, 8,000 other features of the balls that I'm going to look at, that's like taking a draw over and over again, right? And so, yeah. That's a great point. So, so the, the point is, is that the features that themselves can be linked. Yes, and so, so we're, um, in this case, I'm assuming that the features are all independent of one another. Certainly, if the features are linked uh, one to another, it's not it's taking as many effective draws. Now, now, the issue is, is that, is if you know something about how all the features are linked together, you can do the multiple test corrections slightly differently. The multiple test corrections that I'm telling you about are ones where you, you don't know anything about the linkage of the features. Because basically, when you compute a p-value, you want to be as conservative as possible, because you're making a claim. So the p-value that you compute is a bound, an upper bound on the p-value. Right? So if we assume that all these annotations are independent from one another, and we make the correction making that assumption, that stringent p-value is going to be higher than the, the other p-value which, which incorporates all this information. Right? But we want to be careful, right? You want to avoid making false positive claims. And that's what the p-values are all about. Okay. Okay, so this is the super stringent cor correction that assumes that all these annotations are different from one another. Right? It assumes that all the annotations are independent. And this correction is called the von Peroni correction. I love this correction because it's so easy to explain. And I can show you an equation here. I don't feel uncomfortable about doing so. And so say you have m different gene sets or annotations that are, correct, uh, that are tested. The corrected p-value is just the original p-value times m. So let's say we're using gene ontology. We have 1,000 categories. We've computed p-values for every single one of those categories. The von Peroni corrected p-value is 1,000 times the p-value that, that I, we compute for all those categories. Okay, now, now this issue, does that make sense? Yeah, okay, easy, right? Okay, now the issue of the p-value being an upper bound on the actual p-value comes up here, 
right? So now say that we test the category, we get, it, there's no enrichment at all, we get a p-value of 0.5, right? That's not significant, right? It's not 0.05, it's 0.5, it's 50%. Now we're gonna take that p-value and we're gonna multiply it by 1,000. What do we get? We get 500. We have a p-value of 500. Now that sounds stupid, right? Because p-values are supposed to be at maximum one, right? And, and this is the point that people start to freak out, usually. But what, but what that means is, is it just means it's an upper bound, right? The p-value is less than 500. Great, right? We probably, in that case, you know it's also less than one because p-values can't be greater than one. But that's, this is what this gives you. This von Cronin correction gives you an upper bound because it's making as few assumptions as possible. It's using something called the union bound in, in, in probability, which, you know, like I said, is, is assuming that all the annotations are independent, and as you brought out, the annotations might be linked in some way, so that like two different annotations might actually be testing the same thing, okay? All right, and that this, this whole thing here about it being a bound, being greater than or equal to the probability of one or more of these, there's, there's a random draw. So, I mean, this is the technical thing uh, that corresponds to what I just said. And then sometimes when people do the von Veroni correction, they, they call this controlling for the family-wise error rate. Okay, and the only reason I put this down is that there are, people come up with more careful corrections in the von Veroni correction that also do the same thing that are basically the same in the von Veroni correction. So sometimes you'll see in a paper that someone is correcting for the family-wise error rate, they're gonna use some correction that you don't know but it's essentially going to be the bond forming. It might be a little bit better than the bond forming. Okay? Okay, so the problem is, is that, you know, if you're gonna multiply your p-values by 1,000, uh, you're in big trouble often, right? Um, so, so it's very stringent. It can wash away your enrichments, leading to false negatives, right? Now, if you know, are good friends with a statistician and you, and, you, and you know that there's some links between your annotations, sometimes you can incorporate that information when you're computing a p-value that corrects for family-wise error rate. But there's another thing that people uh, have done in genomics, and this was actually you know, introduced in genomics, is to accept a less stringent condition. And that and condition is called the false discovery rate or the FDR. And this leads, leads to much gentler correction when there are real enrichments. Okay, so what's the difference between the family-wise error rate and the false discovery rate? Let's see if I have a slide about that. Okay. Oh, good, I do. Okay. So the family-wise error rate, the bond for only correction, is once you do that, you compute the p-values, that's the probability that, I, the, it's the probability that one or more of your observed enrichments are due to random chance, right? And it's an upper bound on that, one or more. So it could be one, or it could be two, or it could be 10. It's like, it's like saying there's, there's no, none of these enrichments are due to random chance. So like it's one, like one minus the p-value, right? Zero, okay? The family-wise error rate is the expected proportion of the observed enrichments that are due to random chance. Okay, so, so I run, um, I run, like I compute p-values for each one of my individual categories, and then I do a bond for only correction, and then, you know, some of my categories after I, uh, after I multiply by the bond uh, by 1,000 have a p-value of 0.01, right? So what that means is the probability that any one of the enrichments that I'm gonna report above that are higher, sorry, let me take a step back and let me explain that again. So I, I'm using a number that you guys are Let's say we are, our significance threshold is 5%, okay? All right, so we compute p-values for each one of the 1,000 categories, then we multiply by 1,000 to get our bond for only corrected p-value, and then we find that 100 of the categories still have p-values less than 0.05. Okay, now we're gonna call those significant. Right, with a bond for only corrected p-value of 0.05. So what does that mean? We said that means that there's a 5% chance or less that any of these 100 are false enrichments. Okay, you got that? It's one or more. FDR is the proportion of these 100 that are false enrichments. So if we do the FDR correction for the p-value, and we corrected a false discovery rate of 
and we have 100 enrichments that we're going to report, what the FDR is saying is that probably, no, uh, on, on average, no more than 5% of these 100 are false. So that says it, the, the number that are false is are 5 or less, on average. Does that make sense? Okay. So some people are comfortable with that. I mean, certainly a lot of people are comfortable with that. Now, it doesn't necessarily tell you which ones are the ones that are false. But it says, you know, in general, I'd say like 5%. Sometimes people correct it, false discovery rate of 10%. That's very popular. So, so the 10% of my observed enrichments are, are due to random chance. Okay, and as you can imagine, that makes a, a much less, that makes a much less stringent threshold. And certainly how stringent that threshold depends, it is, depends on how many enrichments you report. If you're going to report 700 enrichments, then you're saying like no more than, and you're correcting it 10%, you're saying, on average, about 70 of my enrichments are going to be false positives. Okay. So it becomes less stringent as you report more enrichments, because you're going from 5 to, say, 70. Okay. So now, how do you compute that? So I told you how to cor cor uh, compute the bond for only. Everybody can now do that. You just count your number of tests and multiply by the p value. This, is computing the false discovery rate, is a little bit more complicated, but not much more complicated. You can do it in the next step. Okay. So, so the first thing you do is you take all the things that you're going to test for, and these are the different categories, and there's 53 of them, and you compute their, the, the, the p-value, say so it's using Fisher's exact test. And this is called the nominal p-value. That's the p-value you compute with Fisher's exact test before you do the correction. Okay? And you just rank them from smallest to largest. Okay. So then the next thing you do is you compute the adjusted p-value. What you, what's, how do you compute the adjusted p-value? You multiply by the number of tests that you did, but then you divide by the rank in the list. So up here, this is just the p-value. I'm taking the p-value and multiplying by 53. That's the number of tests I did. That's the bond for only corrected p-value right there at the top of the list. But now when I get to go down here, I'm, you know, it comes out to be 053 because I constructed this example myself. But now I'm multiplying by 53 divided by 2. So it's a less of a correction, right? And that correction gets less and less and less as I go down. The last p-value, I don't correct at all, right? I just take the straight p-value because I'm multiplying by 53 divided by 53, right? So now we have the adjusted p-value. Now here, look, these p-values aren't necessarily in, in decreasing order anymore, right? Because the correction, the thing you're multiplying by gets smaller as you go down. Okay, you can see that, 0.05, 0.053, 0.053. 0.040053. And the math is there if you want to try to reproduce this afterwards. Okay. So now the FDR, the false discovery rate, and people sometimes call this the Q value instead, you get that by for each one of the ranks, you look at the smallest p value, adjusted p value at that rank or higher. So at this rank, the smallest p value at this rank or higher is 0.053. At this rank, the smallest p-value at this rank or higher is 0.04. So it's FDR becomes 0.04. That makes sense. Okay. And now your, your p-value threshold for false discovery rate less than 0.05 is the p-value at which the FDR reaches 0.05. Right now. Even though this list right here doesn't always increase, this list always increases, right? Because this value here is going to be the minimum of uh, this or any, uh, any that occur below. And this value is going to be the minimum of this or anything that occurs below. So it's always going to increase or be the same. OK, so now this is the p-value threshold at which you have to correct for, to have a false discovery rate of 0.05. Now this is, you can implement this in Excel. It's really easy to implement in Excel. I mean, most of the tools that we're describing are going to do this correction for you, but if you're ever like, you know, in the wilderness and all you have is Excel, you're still okay. <laughs> all right. So um, any questions about that? Okay. So, so now I told you about two different corrections that you can make. To, uh, to, you know, to make sure that the p-values you report, you're not reporting like false, uh, false positive enrichments. 
Okay, but there's there's other things, and some of them are stringent, and that, even the FDR can be a little bit stringent. But there's a lot of things you can do to avoid having to make these like really nasty corrections on your p-values, right? So if you're going to test 10,000 gene sets, you're always going to have to multiply your p-values by 10,000, or you're going to have to do the FDR. But then the FDR will save you under some circumstances, but it won't always save you, right? So so another way of dealing with this is to reduce the number of tests that you do, right? So if you're only interested in some functions, only test for those functions, right? That's the first thing that I would suggest. The second thing that I would suggest is think about statistical power when you're doing the corrections and whether or not the thing that you're, when you're choosing what tests to do, think about statistical power and think about what the test will tell you. Right, so um, as Yuri explains, the, the gene ontology is re represented as a, as a hierarchy, right? So the, the nodes at the top of the gene ontology are things like development, metabolism, stuff like that. Very broad, not super informative things, right? And then the middle nodes are things like, say, like eye development is the example that I, that I came up with, right? And so those are sort of the middle nodes of the, of, of the gene ontology. Hierarchy. And then at the bottom, they're very, very specific processes. Okay, so if you're going to choose categories to test, I would test the middle, right? Because the top nodes, I mean, depending upon what you want to do, there's not that many categories at the top, so you can throw them in if you want. But like, does development tell you what you want to know? Does metabolism tell you what you want to know? It might be a little bit too broad for you. The stuff at the bottom is very informative, right? I don't know. I can't even think of something off the top of my head, but it's very specific. But these gene sets, they only have like three genes in them. Now the problem with testing for a gene set that only has three genes is you don't have a lot of statistical power. The p-values that you can get, the significance, the size of the p-value depends upon the, the size of the gene list, which we've already discussed, but also depends on the size of the gene set. So if you only have three genes in the gene set, there's some like minimum that your p-value can get to, and that minimum is often simply not small enough to survive the correction. Right, so, so what do I do in this case? So, so some of the tools that, that are out there, like David, for example, they allow you to, they, they allow you to select go, on, uh, go enrichments to test based on where they are in the hierarchy. And G-Profiler does the same thing, right? No, it doesn't, never mind. But, but G-Profiler does something that I, that I like better, and that's selecting the category by size. So, so select gene sets that are in a given size range. Here, you want to say something? I'll, I'll repeat. So, so, so what? So, we, what Yuri was saying is, is that that conceptually, selecting a, a particular goal level. Is, is not really a meaningful concept because when you say, I'm going to select goal level three, well, there's some nodes, that's like the number of parents until you get to the top node. But there's some nodes that are both at level three and level four and level two because there's multiple paths to the top node. So if you go one path, it's got two parents. If you go another path, it's, sorry, not two parents, two ancestors. If you go another path, it's got three ancestors. So it's not a meaningful concept. Um, but Going by goal, slide, uh, goal category size has always been worked pretty well for me. And so, you know, you use sizes that would allow you to get p-values that are small enough. So usually as a minimum, I use about 10, sometimes 30 genes as a minimum size that I work at. Right, and what that, what that does is that removes a lot of the smaller goal categories so you're not testing for them. And because, and because you're not testing for them, they don't go into the number that you have to multiply by when you do the correction. Okay. Now, just let me caution you about something here, though. You can't make any choices about the tests that you're going to do after you've done the tests. Right? That's cheating, right? That's circular. You're like, oh, these aren't significant. I'm going to remove them when I compute the, uh, when I compute the, the size of the correction I need to do. Okay. So, that, that, and that's obvious that you can't do that. What people want to do sometimes 
is, is they take their gene list and they say, okay, we're not going to test for any categories that aren't represented somewhere in the gene list. Right? So, like, you know, I have a, a set of uh, 10 genes. None of these genes are involved in eye development, so I'm not going to test for eye development. That's like implicitly doing the test, right? There you are counting. You're still doing the test implicitly by like finding your, by finding the fact that there's no eye development genes in your gene list. So that, that's not fair either. And that's like looking at the result in your enrichment test when you choose the, the test that you're going to do the enrichment. Isn't that a lot like uh, looking at the street lamps in the dark when you walk through? You can't look in the dark the way, you, the way you presented that makes it sound like it's okay, but it, it's not okay. <laughs> yeah. It is. It's a practical thing that people might do. That's why it's important to know that it's not okay. <laughs> right? It's an obvious thing to do. I mean, I want to do it too, but, but it's, it's not okay. I mean, it's not perfectly okay, but it's it's mostly okay, and it's what people do anyways. Yeah, as long as you correct for increasing the number of categories. Michelle. Oh, I'm sorry. So the question is, you start with a small, let's say you start with Gold Slim. You start with a small list, you don't find any significant things significant, so that you increase the list of categories, uh, and then you test in the larger list of categories. Um, and is that okay? As long as when you test in the larger list of categories, you do the appropriate correction for the larger list. It's almost okay. And it's, it's almost okay enough that a lot, that's what a lot of people already do. Right? So, I mean, in theory, you shouldn't be allowed to, like, choose a category test and then choose a category test and so forth because you're kind of using information about all the categories when you do that. But... You know, people do do this, and it's it's not terribly bad. So it's okay. Uh, just a, you know, just among us, I'm gonna say it's okay. <laughs> but if you're if you're going to find significance in what you're using a gold limb, you are most likely cannot get it significantly in all the data. No, I don't agree with that. So so the the point was, if you don't find significance with gold slim, you're not going to find significance with smaller categories. So now, now I think you're right in that the gold slim is a larger category, so so it's going to be you're going to have more statistical power. But it might be when you have the gold slim categories, like you you know part of gold slim would be development. Oh, what I said is the reverse one. Like if you use the if you're trying to find the significant result using gold slim, then you are most likely and if you use the larger data set, you you, you are less likely. Using the full data set. Yeah, so by full data set, you mean the full set of annotations, right? Yeah. Right, but that's not necessarily true. It's not necessarily true that if you don't find significance in Gold Slim, you're not going to find significance with more categories. Because if Gold Slim had very broad categories like development, right, which means that your gene set might contain things that are being affected by your assay, but also a lot of things that aren't being affected by it. And the things that aren't being affected by your assay are contributing to decreased enrichment. So if you can be a little bit more specific about the question that you're asking, like eye development, you can get significance even if like, the entire set of development genes is not enriched. I mean, you could imagine that like, you know, genes involved in eye development are upregulated when genes involved in, say, liver development are. Okay, more questions about that. Great. Okay. Wow. I think we're on time. So, uh, today I told you about uh, statistical tests for a gene list, and there's one you need to know in Fisher's exact test. Uh, and then rank lists, there's a bunch of them. I described the minimum hypergeometric test, but you know the GSCA and Coleman Garmon Spiranoff test, you can call it the chaos test, everybody does, are, are equally, uh, are, are, they do basically the same thing using a slightly different scoring method. Wilcoxon and Man Whitney are like t-tests. 
basically it's one way to think about it. And I talked about the, uh, two multiple test corrections. One is the von Brony correction. This controls for the probability that at least one false positive. It's called, also called the family-wise error rate. And the other test I talked about is more forgiving and it controls the ex expected proportion of false positives. Right, so if you have a thousand tests that you're gonna say, uh, sorry, if you have a uh, hundred categories you're gonna say are enriched, the von Brony p-value is the p-value that any one of those is a false positive. And the FDR is the proportion, the expected proportion of those that are false positive. Okay. And there's the learning objectives. Uh, and are there any questions? Let's go here. And that's a very good point. And so, so the, the point is, is that there's two things that go on when you go from go slim to a, a larger annotation database. So you get something that's more specific, but because you're testing more categories, your your multiple test correction becomes harsher. Yeah, and that's a very good point. Uh, question. So 5% of them on average will be due to random chance. That pass the FDR. That pass the FDR. Yeah. So, but, but here's the thing, so like, okay. So say I did um, 10,000 tests. No, let's say I did 1,000 tests, right? Um, you know, I can calculate the p-values for all those tests, and if, it, if, the, if it's just random chance, that those p-values, they're, they're a random variable that's uniformly distributed on the interval between one and zero. So what that means is if I do 1,000 tests, and it's just random, like just random choosing, 50 of those tests are gonna have a p-value less than 0.05. Right, but every one of those tests is a false positive. Right, what the FDR says is that, okay, so I do like, I do 1,000 tests, I get some tests that pass an FDR of 0.05, let's say I get 100 tests that pass an FDR of 0.05, five of those are going to be false positive because it's five of the ones that pass. So, so you're right, so, so the p-value, nominal p-value of 0.05, is like that's the probability that this is, this, that you got this enrichment due to just a random chance. But that doesn't mean that if you just threshold a 0.05, that 5% 5 of the tests that pass the threshold are going to be due to random chance, or going to be false positive. Does this make sense? Yes, right. Okay. So let me let me try to explain it again. Or you you want to try it? Or are you are, is this is your question related to this question, or is it a, is it? So, so the, the, the issue that you're talking about is how you choose the threshold. 
Okay, uh, let's get back to that in a second. I want to completely address this question because it's a really important point. Okay, so so there there's there is two things that you so okay. So what we're asking is when we report something as being significantly enriched, what's the probability that it's a false positive? Okay, now I'm using that the terminology very loosely because it's not the p value is not quite that. But let's just like in this room think that that, that it, it means like a probability of false positive. Okay. All right. All right. So we do a, a thousand experiments. Sorry, not a thousand experiments. We do a thousand tests, and we get some collection of things that pass that p value threshold. Okay. So if you do a thousand tests. 5% of them are going to pass the p-value threshold of 0.05. Because that's what a p-value means. It's the probability that you get that enrichment or higher due to random chance. So, like, you run this, you do 1,000 tests, there's no real enrichment, but you still get 50 that pass the p-value of 0.05. So, in this case, every single one of those 50 is a false enrichment. Okay, that's what happens when you, when you look at the nominal p-value. Okay. When you look at the FDR, the FDR is saying something about all the tests that pass the enrichment. Okay, so for example, in this case, we do like an FDR, uh, we do an FDR correction. Let's say we get like 10 tests that, that pass the FDR threshold of 0.05. Now here, in this new world, there actually are some tests that are significant. Right, there is some significant enrichment. So if we, did I say 10 tests? Okay, I'm going to say 100 instead. Because <laughs> taking 5% of 10 is not fun, right? Okay, so there's 100 tests that pass the enrichment. So now, what the FDR is saying is 5% of those 100 tests are false positives. So that's 5 tests out of the 100. Sorry, 5 of the significant enrichments out of the 100 are false positives. Right? Now, in the nominal case, all of them were false positives. Right? In this case, I'm guaranteeing you that on average, 5% of them are false positives. So now we go to the Bonferroni case. 100 tests pass the, the p-value threshold, the bounding wise error rate correction. The p-value 0.05 means there, it means there's only a 5% chance that any of them are false positives. Right? So it's not, you know, so like on average, zero are false positives. When you have uh, when you pass a bond from the correction, on average, five percent are 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 false positives when you pass the FDR, and when you just use the nominal, it's possible that all of them are false positives. Okay, does that make sense? Okay. This is important to this. It's important to distinguish between the two. 